Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Kavinsky and I just want to welcome you all. It is now 1 p.m. so we will begin our presentation shortly. Today on Friday, December 9th, we have our presentation on Blue Urbanism given by Tim Beatley. Pardon me while my computer gets this loaded up. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we will be able to answer those during, at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of the sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible. As you can see, we have um, quite a few webcasts already scheduled for um, 2012, so you can register for these upcoming webcasts at www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts and uh, register for your webcast of choice. We are now offering distance education webcasts to help you get your ethics or law credits before the end of the year. These webcasts are available to view at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast-archive. You can now follow us on Twitter, at Planning Webcast, or like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series sponsored by chapters, divisions, and universities. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM, select today's date, Friday, December 10th, uh, 9th, sorry, and then select today's webcast, Blue Urbanism. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. We are recording today's webcast and it will be available along with a six slide per page PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive. At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Tim Beatley. Tim Beatley is the Ter Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning at the University of Virginia, where he has taught for the last 25 years. Much of Beatley's work focuses on the subject of sustainable communities and creative strategies by which cities and towns can fundamentally reduce their ecological footprints while at the same time becoming more livable and equitable places. He is the author or co-author of more than 15 books, including Green Urbanism, Native to Nowhere, Ethical Land Use, and his most recent book, Biophilic Cities. Beatley also writes a regular column for Planning Magazine called Evergreen about environmental and sustainability matters. He holds a PhD in city and regional planning from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Let's all welcome Tim Beatley. Okay. Well, thank you, Brittany. And I'm going to first make sure that I can get the slides up so that everybody can see them. So try that. Hopefully that's good. And you can Sorry Tim, I'm getting those. them getting it switched over to you in just a second. Oh, okay. Um, so Brittany, you'll tell me when I'm when I'm ready then. When Okay. Oh, there we go. Ah. So, let's see. Show mine. Okay. So every, you should all be seeing these slides, I'm hoping, at this, at this point. Um, so blue, blue urbanism. So as Brittany has said, uh, I I'm, I'm teach in an urban planning program. I do a, a lot of work on sustainability and environmental <clears throat> planning and uh, have, have spent a lot of time thinking about cities and how we can green uh, cities, green them in the sense of making them uh, function on a smaller uh, ecological footprint, so reducing their physical space, their material consumption, their energy consumption, and greening them literally in terms of, of, of trees and nature and so on. And uh, there is a part of my life that uh, deals with um, thinking about uh, uh, coastal uh, environments. Let's see, how am I going to advance here? Uh, let's try this, let's see if this works. Hmm, it does not seem to be advancing. Um, let me keep trying here. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Let's see. Hmm, maybe down here. Let's try that. 
Yes, that works. <laughs> okay. Um, but I, and I do have, have written a, a fair amount about coastal ma management, coastal planning, coastal zone management, and, uh, um, and thinking a lot about that. And, and, but this is really quite, quite different. And it all started really with some time, a, a lot of time spent in Australia in, in recent years, where there, to my way of thinking, there is a sensibility about the ocean and a connection to the sea that in many ways is admirable. And I want to talk a little bit more about that as we, as we go along. So I uh, be, sort of began thinking about blue urbanism. I wrote a, a, one of these evergreen columns for Planning Magazine, kind of devoted to that topic, and then a, a longer version of blue, blue urbanism essay for a journal called Places, an online uh, journal. And uh, and then um, actually Jennifer Cowley um, sent me a nice email and said, "Let's why don't you do a, a webinar about this?" And so this is all by way of saying that this is very new to to, to me. And uh, the purpose really of this hour or so is to throw out a, a number of things to think about, n maybe some new ways to think about cities and as they might connect and relate to marine and ocean uh, environments. So. So blue, blue urbanism is probably language that you're not using yet, but, but I hope that, that you will. And, and um, hopefully this today will be provocative. And, and you'll see at the very end, I want, to, I want to enlist everyone listening to help me um, flesh it out and, 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 and give it some meaning and, and provide some examples of, of, of blue urbanism. So what it means and what it requires is still very much um, a formative thing, still very much to be um, to determined. This is kind of my, I guess, what I have in mind. The notion of connecting urban populations and connecting cities with a sense of caring about and action to care about ocean and, and marine environments. And you'll see I have a number of ideas of, of ways that we might, we might do that. So you could also say that blue, blue, blue is one of those words that we, we already, of course, use it in, in planning circles. And we, we do tend to mean water. And I had someone the other day ask me, well, well when you're talking about blue ur urbanism, are you also talking about freshwater rivers and, and lakes? And, and, and of course, we could think about water in the sense of, of all the things we do in planning, managing stormwater and floods. And, and uh, what about low impact development? If a community does that, are they blue? Is it, um, is it a way of describing this blue urbanism a, a, ter a term that would make that would have some meaning? And and those that's probably uh, those are probably good ways to use it. But I'm using it here today uh, very, in a very distinctive way, using it um, in reference to oceans, oceans and marine environments, and not that those other um, dimensions of water uh, are not not important. They are very important. Uh, but uh, this is a particular uh, area where I think we need to do some more thinking. And, and, and we need some new language and some new impetus, maybe, to move forward. So cities and urban populations that care uh, about the condition of ocean and marine environments and that take tangible steps and programs to protect and, and restore them. So the inspirations are, are many. And I, I'd like to start with a, a uh, quote or two from Sylvia Earle. Sylvia Earle is one of the one of our heroes and one of the people who uh, has has been uh, raising the alarm bells about the condition of oceans of our ocean environment. And uh, this is a the cover of her uh, I think her most recent book called The World Is Blue: How Our Fate and, and the Oceans Are One. And and it's really it's really a terrific book and and shaped my thinking uh, when I started reading it uh, two two summers ago. And the basic point, of course, is that we live on the blue blue planet, but we tend to function as if we don't, or we tend to ignore that pretty basic uh, fact. And it's maybe not uh, a hard thing to understand. The hum human nature suggests that we're going to pay attention to those things that are around us, um, the things that we can see, the things that maybe are most visible to us. And even in urban settings, even in cities that are perched on the edge of oceans, it may be hard. It may be, it is hard for us to understand uh, the, the life and full ecology and complexity of those ocean environments and many of places that, of course, will be hundreds or thousands of miles away um, and really be underwater and beyond our sight. So, so it's, uh, it, it's an important the thing to connect. And the other major point is that cities and ur urban populations and urban lifestyles affect the, the, the condition of oceans in some pretty amazing 
uh, in important ways. So let's see, I'm going to try and advance, advance scan here. So why are our ocean, ocean and marine environments important for us to, to, to think about? There are many reasons. And here, uh, again, uh, this is from The World is Blue, Sylvia Earle's um, book. The ocean drives climate and weather, regulates temperature, holds 97% of the Earth's water, and embraces 97% of the biosphere. Far and away, the greatest abundance and diversity of life occurs in the ocean, um, occupying liquid space from the sunlit surface to the greatest depths. Um, even if you never have the chance to see or touch the ocean, uh, the ocean touches you. Every breath you take, every drop of water you drink, every bite you consume, everyone everywhere is inextricably connected to and utterly dependent upon the existence of the sea. Very, very eloquent, and uh, the argument in you know in a in a very in, a, in one quick paragraph. We are we are tied to the ocean, and our fate uh, is tied closely to the condition, the quality, the health of that that ocean environment. And we are on the ocean planet. Three quarters of our planet is ocean. So. So working to try to make that ocean relevant to cities, and it's kind of interesting to think about our urbanizing planet as we've, we've now passed the 50% urban mark on the way to 70 or 80 or whatever it will be. And so we are an increasingly urban planet. It becomes ever more important to connect those cities and urban populations to, to the health of, uh, of oceans. And we can do it in, in many um, different ways. Well, urban populations care about about oceans, I think, is an interesting thing for us to to ponder. And for me, this goes back to some of the experiences I've had in Australia. Um, and begin, actually, going back to 2005, if you probably some of you don't know what this is, this is a whale sh picture of a whale shark. And uh, there's a there's a place in uh, Western Australia. You hear uh, a lot about the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but on the other side of the country, there's a, a a tremendous fringing reef called Ningaloo uh, Reef. And it has been threatened with development over the years. And they have been able to protect it, beaten back some major large resort developments that would have done damage. And it happens to be a place of tremendous uh, bi biodiversity for, for ocean creatures, in, including a, an area where whale sharks congregate. And uh, I was there in 2005, lived in, not in Ningaloo, but lived in, in the Perth region in a little town called Fremantle. And it was, the, it was the center of the campaign to stop this resort development uh, based around the, the sense of, of wanting to, a sense of caring about the creatures, in particular the, the whale shark. And, and it was my first insight, I guess, into how a, an urban population, a population of a couple of million people, uh, several hundred kilometers away from from the from this particular ocean environment, could um, could care about and and could activate a sense of caring and 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 become energized around conservation. That that they even though they weren't seeing it every day and and may have a limit may have had a limited knowledge of that reef, they cared about it. And when when given the insight and information and, and, and that connection was made, they, they, they uh, sprang into action. Um, this past summer, we, we uh, spent part of the summer in Australia as well and, and uh, learned that one of my colleagues, one of the things you can do, uh, there, a kind of sustainable tourism uh, opportunity is to, for, for limited number of boats, they will take you out and, and they, they, you can swim, actually, with the whale sharks. They're very gentle. And um, one of my colleagues, 85-year-old mother, was looking forward to doing this, and it was quite apparently quite a quite an event for her. And it, it wasn't uncommon to hear about people in the city of Perth talking about the, the uh, whale sharks and about Ningaloo Reef. And and uh, and and several times when we lived in Australia, there were there were uh, whale there were whale beachings, actually terrible events um, where a call would go out on, on the radio, and uh, in a matter of a few minutes, hundreds of people would descend on a beach somewhere um, to help to try to save whales. And one of the last ones was a, a, a pot of pilot pilot whales. We don't understand why they get why they do this, but uh, th th these are examples of ways, visceral examples for me, of ways in which urban populations 
um, can be shown to really care about, about coastal and marine uh, creatures anyway, if not the larger um, environments. But we have become profoundly disconnected from all aspects of nature. I, I do this thing sometimes where I ask uh, people to tell me if they can identify. I show them photographs of uh, birds and common species of birds and trees and plants. And, and generally, I find that they're, um, they're not able much to, to tell me correctly, um, not able to identify. And, and that's, in some ways, a, a sign of the times. We're spending more time on computers, and we may be learning more about something far away, but uh, not so much about the nature uh, around us. And this year I did, or last year and this year, I did this interesting thing where I showed some Im images that you're seeing now of uh, marine creatures and asked uh, students just to identify what they, I didn't, I didn't give them the labels that you're seeing here, to, to identify them. And it's, it's a little bit surprising that a very distinctive sea turtle, like the loggerhead sea turtle, uh, most of my students can't uh, visually identify. And the same is true with different species of, of whales, even though um, a sperm whale, the, the form of that whale, the size and shape of that whale is so dramatically different from, say, a humpback or the northern right whale that you see um, here. So um, there are lots of, there's lots of evidence, I think, that would, that would confirm that um, we, have, we are disconnected from, from the, the, certainly the nature around us, but also the nature like, like marine and, and ocean, ocean nature that we can't see very much uh, of. So there is a lot of it, though. And here are some examples, in fact, from the, the uh, recent census of marine life. It is, it is commonly said, and it is true, I think, that uh, there is more biodiversity in oceans, particularly when you look at the phylum level. You look at, at species and, and creatures that do things that, that, that land-based creatures just don't do, and, and a diversity at that phylum level is really quite remarkable. Here's just some, some examples. So we've just uh, finished the 10-year ten ten census of marine life, which was a process for collecting information. There were hundreds, probably thousands of scientists uh, around the world uh, doing projects and research uh, to document uh, the biodiversity in oceans. And, and there have been a series of, of documents to come out of that um, this is one of them um, written by Nancy, um, a quote from Nancy uh, Knowlton, uh, the 2010 book. Uh, at the end of the 10-year census of marine life, most, most ocean organisms remain nameless and their numbers um, unknown. This is not an admission of failure. The ocean is simply so vast that after a decade of hard work, we still only have a snapshot, though sometimes detailed, of what the sea contains. The sea is today in trouble. Its citizens have no vote in any national or international body, but they are suffering and need to be heard. Um, tremendous biodiversity, but it's just uh, skimming the surface. We just barely uh, understand that biodiversity. And, and uh, the statistic you'll sometimes hear about having, having explored maybe 5% of the ocean, the ocean seafloor, uh, for instance. It's a vast, that vastness uh, hides so much of what's there, but it is, in fact, being impacted and is in, uh, in trouble in many, in many ways. OK, um, I'm going to maybe move a little bit faster now, if I can. And I'm not getting very far with my slides. Um, so what, what are the connections between cities and the health of ocean and marine environments? And, and some are very obvious, and, and some are uh, clearly direct, and some are more indirect. And uh, the, the, the land-based pollution that makes its way into, into coastal environments might be an example of a direct cause. Um, a more direct path, indirect pathway might be the, the urban form of our cities that requires us to be very car dependent. We know that's the case with most American cities, and we have a heavy dependence on, on oil and fossil fuels more generally, and that has uh, an impact, of course, on oceans. And the Deepwater Horizon spill is, um, is one of the more dramatic events to have happened and a very sad event from my perspective, but, um, but not an uncommon event in the sense that there are lots of spills and lots of impacts that, that perhaps don't get as much, as much attention. But the connection between urban form and urban lives and, and cars 
and oil spills, not not uh, not a connection lost on on planners. And and uh, for example, uh, Todd Littman uh, ha wrote a, wrote actually I think a series of essays in Planetism. Uh, one of them uh, entitled "Sacrificing Pel Pelicans to Petroleum Gods," in which he makes that direct connection uh, that that uh, uh, one of the one of the uh, ramifications or one of the 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 responses uh, that we might imagine from planning is to is to redouble our efforts to reduce consumption of oil, dependence on oil, and he makes the connection to uh, smart transportation smart transportation, energy conservation strategies, and a whole host of things that most of us in planning would support, from uh, increasing fuel taxes, transit and ride share improvements, walking and cycling improvements, car sharing, smart growth policies, uh, any number of things that we tend to, to talk about. That's a direct connection, um, uh, a, a way in which uh, oceans are impacted by, by urban reform. But there are many other ways this uh, is a very interesting uh, image, a map that's uh, been prepared by the New England uh, Aquarium, and it's actually part of a northern right whale uh, study that they have. They've been um, producing some pretty impressive uh, materials lately in that on that subject. Uh, but this is a what I'm calling uh, an example of ocean sprawl. We tend, of course, to talk a lot about terrestrial sprawl. Um, but we really should be thinking about sprawl in the much larger sense. It's not just the things that happen, not just the form, uh, not just the suburban or exurban development patterns on land. It's the extension of those things on on water, ocean, ocean and marine environments. So this is an interesting um, uh, image. So you, you'll see there are uh, there's some areas that um, the land-based uh, uh, Areas are coded uh, by extent of watershed impacts, and, the, and then there's a series of ocean impacts from from blue low being uh, blue being low to red being high, and, uh, and the watershed impacts low being green and, and uh, uh, red being high as well. And so the red areas represent uh, extremely urban, a high high density of human activities. Blue areas represent relatively untouched o oceanic habitat. Uh, so the marine data part of it uh, is a compilation of dredge, dredge disposal sites, shipping intensity, and fishing intensity. That's averaged by statistical area. So, and the terrestrial watershed overlays include population density, numbers of toxic chemical releases, and percentage of land and agriculture. So um, it, it's an interesting effort, particularly on the ocean side, to begin to to, to layer all of these these different uses and understand that, that the, they, in, in a sense, are the extension of the urban and industrial activities that happen on, on land base. So the, the movement, the, the traffic from ocean uh, vessel, so it's, uh, the movement of goods, one could argue that that's a, that's a component of an urban ecological uh, footprint. It's just it's happening. The impact of it is happening on, on, uh, on an ocean. So uh, got to begin to think about this uh, larger spatial um, um, scope. Um, another example here from, from Cape Cod, from the Massachusetts coast, uh, an, <clears throat> an effort actually to put on a map <clears throat> some of the projects that, that um, tend to happen in, offshore, tend to happen in ocean uh, in, in marine environments, and, and I won't uh, belabor this, but uh, you see everything from liquid natural gas terminals, uh, offshore pipelines, sand mining, energy projects, of course, wind, wind farms we know about, of course, have been uh, controversial and, and uh, off of Cape Cod, um, at waste disposal uh, sites, and so lots of, there are lots of pressures and lots of things uh, happening in on those uh, ocean and coastal uh, offshore environment. There are also, of course, impacts from cities that involve uh, discharge of many different things from uh, from um, municipal solid waste, um, municipal sewage, um, the the impact of of uh, lifestyle and 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 urban populations on on uh, the, this flow of of uh, 
plastics and, and garbage in ocean environments. We've talked about this for uh, a long, a long, long time, and you've probably heard uh, about the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that that um, and and by some estimates, 100 million tons or something like that of of garbage floating. Uh, and, and 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 as this illustration suggests, that there there has been that that um, that. Uh, that big one north of Hawaii, uh, but also a second one actually off the coast of, of Japan, and and now actually a, a rather large one identified uh, along the, in the Atlantic. So um, these are uh, perplexing. What do we do about them, and, and and how do we address them, and do we take some responsibility for them as urban as urbanites generating that that trash, that garbage? We also use the ocean, of course. It, it's a great source of protein, and and we've extracted uh, a lot of things, a lot of fish um, fr from it, from them. And uh, one of the main messages of, of Sylvia Earle's book is that we've we've tended to have the perception of oceans as being this, these places where you can you can throw anything into it, um, discharge anything into it, pollute as much as you want. The ocean is so vast that you won't see uh, any results. You won't see any impacts uh, that it can absorb. It's, the, just the vastness of it uh, makes it so resilient. On the other hand, uh, the popular perception that you can take as much as you want from the ocean, that we can harvest as quickly or as massively, or as, uh, and, and that we will, and it won't be uh, ever, ever a cornucopia. And, and, and we know that that's simply not true any longer as we're watching uh, the long-term decline of, of global fisheries. Been been seeing some some more optimistic stories along along Atlantic along um, American fisheries in some places where, partly because of a stronger fisheries management system here in the U.S., we've we've seen uh, some fisheries rebound, and that's all very all very good. But the the bigger question remains how how we will transition from a planet of seven billion to whatever we will eight or nine or ten or more. Uh, where a very large percentage of the world's population requires for at least partly requires uh, protein from from the sea how how will our ocean environments uh, continue to sustain be sustained and that becomes an urban uh, question um, as well so partly this is about changing our mindset and changing our perception um, in, in, of of the world, I have a, a friend here in the Environmental Sciences Department, Carlton Ray, Ray who uh, actually is one of the first people to be to write about the, the biodiversity and ocean environments. And he was commonly uh, um, incensed that our that our maps uh, never seemed to say very much about oceans. That the that all of our maps kind of had you know all the color and the topography and the interesting things were all happening on land, and then at the edge of that map. You had this empty thing that was maybe it was blue or black or it just was empty, and uh, and what kind of a message that that sent to us. So so this is actually one of the maps that uh, global maps to come out of uh, of this marine um, census that isn't complete by any means, but you'll see some squiggly lines which are whale migration uh, patterns and some some of what we we know. Um, about the ocean environment, and, and, and we'll you know hopefully add to that to this over time. But it certainly is a change in perception. Um, lots of other examples of this. Um, my friend Armando Carbonell from the Lincoln Institute has done a uh, recently done a, um, a graduate uh, planning studio. Uh, in fact, uh, looking at uh, planning in southeastern Massachusetts, in which he did the interesting thing, or the class did the interesting thing of of uh, Putting the region, which is in this red um, uh, shape, putting it in the context of the larger ocean and marine environment and, and its relationship to the Gulf of Maine in particular. I think that kind of orientation, spatial orientation, would help uh, a great deal. There is an awful lot of work going on now in the area of ocean and and marine spatial uh, planning and. Uh, some of it has grown out of uh, state coastal zone management programs like the one on the right, which is uh, one of the early efforts at, a, at an ocean uh, plan. Um, and that's uh, from the state of Oregon. Uh, on the left, actually, is uh, the interesting example of the Cape Cod Commission. And they have just 
uh, recently, in fact, October 13th, uh, issued their Cape Cod Ocean Management Plan, which applies to this um, extended spatial boundary. Here's a here's a cover shot of the of the plan, which can be had online, can be gotten from their their website, and and a whole series of spatial maps for this larger this ocean environment around the Cape, which is interesting. And and here you have an example of the mapping of what they're calling special, sensitive, and unique core habitat areas. So th these are important uh, uh, environments for right, right whales and humpback whales and fin whales and, and, um, and, and very various bird species and, and, and habitats like eelgrass. And so a whole series of uh, habitat maps and resource maps and then uh, leading to the kinds of planning uh, maps that we often do for terrestrial environments. In this case, as you see here, is a wind energy avoidance area. So you'll see a lot of it is along the shore. It's, it, it incorporates visual impact as well. Um, but um, m m mapping that leads then to planning and policy decisions about where you cite things and where you uh, shouldn't cite things and and trying to again take the the condition the quality the the health of that ocean environment and the species uh, that inhabit it into into account so the bigger the bigger uh, track here the bigger bigger story really is that this uh, marine and, and ocean spatial planning is now happening in many parts of the US and there was an interagency ocean policy task force that um, that fleshed out a framework uh, for this that uh, divides the country into um, a series of reg regions and so um, and, and sets in motion a process for doing this kind of uh, um, marine spatial planning in, in various places. And so in my part of the world, it's called MARCO, the Mid-Atlantic um, Ocean uh, Planning Process. Here's the map just showing you some of the showing you the different uh, um, regions around the country. So it's an exciting time to be thinking about spatial uh, planning in marine, marine and ocean environments. So that's an important uh, step. What, what else ought we to think about? What else ought to be part of a blue, uh, an agenda of blue urbanism? Maybe we ought to think, uh, rethink the very way in which we're moving things around. We say that uh, oceans are out of sight and largely unoccupied by human beings, but it's interesting to look at a map like this um, of shipping uh, lanes and understand that there, at any one point in time, we have a huge occupation of ocean environments, actually, and those uh, that, that shipping um, traffic uh, has uh, a tremendous impact on that environment. Sometimes that impact is, is uh, in, the, in the form of uh, directly uh, killing or harming uh, ocean ocean creatures like the northern right whale here on the left. There are things that we can do to adjust that that traffic. This is the example of ship, uh, moving, shifting the uh, shipping lanes, um, the, Bun the Bay of Fundy, um, to avoid the high density uh, congregation areas for northern right whales. Actually, very very uh, effective. We could imagine greener modes of um, moving. Uh, things around shipping uh, uh, could be green. Might, this might look a little a little fanciful, but um, there's a, a company based in Brussels, actually Sky Sales, um, that uh, sells these systems, and they're they've been being installed. They argue that with these sail systems, uh, it, they can re they can reduce fuel consumption for ships by 35 percent uh, or more. The whole idea of uh, greening ports is is an interesting strategy as well. Lo the Long Beach port in California, when I uh, wrote this essay for uh, for Places Magazine or Places Journal, I got a very uh, interesting uh, email from from officials at the Long Long Beach port saying, "Well, we're we're doing a number of the things you're arguing you're you're arguing for, and greening our our point port." So here's not a very good um, PowerPoint, but this they've adopted a green port policy, which basically makes uh, sustainability their kind of key uh, operating principle, embedding it uh, in, in everything that they do. It's resulted in a, a whole series of, of tangible planning and policy changes. They've been uh, promoting green trucks or clean, clean trucks actually 
and trucks that meet a higher um, emission standard and, and actually putting in place uh, both a regulatory system and also er early on a system of financial incentives so that shipping companies would, would use these green trucks to move goods around. Um, and, and thinking about the, the emissions of, 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 of ships when they're in port, uh, here's an, an example, one of the first uh, examples of a, an electric uh, power um, plug-in. And actually, the image on the right is a, um, a photovoltaics on a, on a, on a ship that uh, um, at least some of the energy needed to actually power the boat uh, coming from, from renewable energy. So that's an important dimension as well. We can, we can imagine greening uh, ports in some sig significant ways, and that that's and there's almost you know always a, um, a port authority or some opportunity for local governments to to be to be pushing pushing this uh, uh, agenda. So another area is to rethink uh, the extraction of things from from oceans. And so here here's a classic uh, connection between again the the footprint, the ecological footprint of that of a city, and and where things are coming from, and th these are back to the images of, of fish. So many many things that we we should be talking about when it comes to reforming the the sourcing of of, uh, of fish and the management of fisheries. In some ways, there are uh, parallels to fishing, global fishing, uh, that are uh, to that are parallel to uh, industrial agriculture. We of course have have seen a, a process of shifting to, to larger and larger um, uh, ships that, that extract um, larger and lar larger um, amounts of fish and then and have tremendous impact on the, on the natural uh, environment uh, in the process. Uh, what can we do about that? What can urban um, populations do to, to exert a change or to affect the change? And, and certainly consumers in cities could make a difference. Here are some examples of some restaurants, a notable example, Turner Fisheries in, in Boston. It's declared last year that it's the first uh, Boston's first 100% sustainable seafood restaurant. Well, what does that mean? It means that they're uh, sourcing all of their fish from, um, from certification systems that ensure, uh, that have, that attempt to ensure uh, that they're coming from from uh, a sustainably managed fishery. So these certification systems are several several kinds, several different examples that we could talk about. This is one for the Gulf of Maine, which is a more local uh, example. Probably a lot of you uh, have heard about the Marine Stewardship Council, uh, which is the, which is a global uh, example. And there are now hundreds, uh, in fact, of, of certified um, fisheries. I'm pulling out my, my numbers now. Actually, 268 fisheries globally that have been engaged in the program, 135 that have actually been certified. So this is a, there's a set of, of, um, of standards, uh, principles and criteria that fisheries have to meet. And then there's a third party verification verification uh, of uh, meeting those standards. And then once all that happens, this, this uh, hopefully is a transparent um, system. And, and once that happens, then, then um, producers can use this label. And consumers, ideally, would, would then seek out products that, that carry the Marine Stewardship uh, Council uh, uh, logo. So it is impressive, the reach of this program. And going back to my statistics here, the, together the certified fisheries um, account for annual catches of close to 9 million metric tons, representing over 10% of the annual global harvest of wild capture fisheries. Um, that's pretty good. Um, it's not a perfect system. The other uh, images you see here on the top are examples of a more consumer-based um, approach, which is uh, the most notable one being Seafood Watch, the um, program of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which attempts to monitor uh, fisheries and puts out these uh, cards um, and, and information to guide consumers, to steer them away from from buying, from choosing fish that um, are uh, that have to create uh, um, and have negative uh, effects on, on on ocean environments and also that are over harvested or in bad uh, condition. So we've, it's interesting to see where the system ends up. And this is a New Seasons Grocery Store in Portland that actually uh, actually 
color codes the, the seafood they sell in their seafood department based on the, the red, yellow, and green um, uh, system of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So green is preferred, red is stay away, and yellow is kind of in the middle, kind of cautionary. So that, that's what? Certification of, of sustainable, uh, man sustainably managed fisheries. We should do more, be doing more of that urbanized. Urban populations can have a big impact there. Uh, we can also do many things to support local fishers. And again, for cities and urban populations perched on the ed edge of oceans and, and marine environments, there, uh, there could be many things, uh, many ways of reorienting consumption in, in ways similar to the other things that we're doing in local food. And so there is the concept of, commu of community-supported agriculture, uh, and now a, a parallel idea of community-supported fisheries that has emerged. A similar notion where you, uh, you buy a share and your, your money is going directly to local fishers. Usually they're, they're, um, they're small-scale operations and they're having less impact on the, on the habitat and they're, and they're um, acquiring, they're harvesting in a more sustainable fashion. And that money is, is, is kept locally for all, all the same arguments for as you have with local local food. So here are some images from one that's not too far away from me called Walking Fish in, in Durham, uh, North, North Carolina. But there are many others. And um, this is one I had the chance to spend some time at uh, last uh, spring, Cape Ann Fresh Catch uh, CSF in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And um, he has Dory, uh, who runs a an organization that had a lot to do with starting this, but it's an interesting uh, CSF. And during during the summer months, at, at its peak, there are more than a thousand members of, of the CSF, and and they are uh, many of them residents of Greater uh, Boston. So it's very much um, an example of a kind of urban connect connecting urbanites with the health of a local a local fishery. So. Uh, NIAS is, by, by the way, part of an organization called Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, or NAMA. They have a terrific website, and they have been um, pa passionate uh, advocates for smaller scale, sustainable uh, fish, fishing, fisher, fishery management. So very, very, very uh, impressive. And, and just like the uh, a CSA, uh, subscribers or members learn much more about the fish that they're eating. First of all, it's fresh, and e e they get it within within a day. So it's getting you're getting a very fresh kind of food, but you're also learning about it. So uh, in the in the a typical share, um, you you would learn that there is more than one kind of flounder. For example, you might understand. You might hopefully learn that there is a difference between yellowtail flounder and blackback flounder. For instance, the difference in its its look, its size, its biology, and a difference in its flavor um, as well. So connecting urbanites directly to that, um, that ocean resource base is, is a key uh, strategy here. Partly this will involve planning and rethinking how we can, how we can make sure that we, we maintain those working waterfronts. So one of the problems in cities like Gloucester is that those places uh, that use those parts of the waterfront that used to be there for processing and for uh, docking boats, uh, that that land use has shifted to other things, in some cases recreation, in some cases uh, housing. But uh, there's a, there are lots of efforts around the country to, to stimulate, to, to um, protect spaces, and to make sure that we, we maintain those working uh, waterfronts. Um, part of the answer to the fishing question has to do with producing more f fish in, in land-based systems. As Sylvia Earle, I've mentioned a couple of times, and she is a major advocate uh, uh, for closed-loop um, uh, aquaculture systems, not the kind that do so much damage, the kinds that are that are filling wetlands and, and doing and, and are, are ocean-based. Those can be very destructive. Uh, but arguing that that in cities actually we could be producing m more of that that those those fish we need that protein that we need and and maybe diverting some of the global demand away, uh, allowing allowing natural fisheries ocean fisheries to to repopulate and and re be restored. So here's an example: Will Allen's uh, growing power, um, an aquaponics example where you have integrated. Uh, uh, vegetable production with fish fish production. So, very interesting system where the the waste from the fish becomes a nutrient 
for growing plants, and it's a, a very much a closed loop sort of system. It's given uh, inspiration to a commercial, full-scale commercial operation in Milwaukee called Sweetwater Organics. You see some images here where they're producing a large amount of perch, a, a species that, that was a favorite uh, species in the Great Lakes. Um, the numbers have crashed, and this, this is a, um, a major uh, opportunity to, to produce fish in a very urban population. This is, a, this is all happening in a, fac in a factory. Um, uh, so it's a kind of a, a re re reuse of an, of an urban building in, in Milwaukee as well. Here's some other images that, that uh, show the, how the system, how the aquaponic system uh, works. I'm fast running out of time, so I'm going to go even a little bit faster. Um, so what else could we do? We could, as uh, cities, uh, redouble our efforts to con control and contain uh, waste, and in particular things like plastics. Um, we, we know that that's a huge, huge uh, problem. A number of very positive things um, have been have been going on. The image on the left is meant to to show the the, uh, the good efforts of cities like San Francisco to um, to ban um, uh, plastic bags, and 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 that's happened, you know, largely justified uh, based on on a concern about about uh, coastal environments. Our ocean environments. The image on the on the right uh, is kind of interesting. I'm going to quote uh, this project Kaize, which which is uh, there have been a number of interesting proposals to go out and extract to clean up the plastics and the waste in in these large areas and actually use it as a fuel. And so the images on the right, and the quote on the right, is is a, meant to, to convey this very interesting a joint commitment uh, between an energy company, Covanta Energy, and this project Kaizai. And they announced this in 2010, um, Project Kaizai taking the lead. They'll collect plastic debris from ocean for, for remediation testing. Covanta Energy will use the debris to test its new waste-to-fuel technology to convert the plastic into a diesel substitute using its catalytic process for converting solid organic materials directly to mineral diesel fuel. If successful, I'm reading from the, from the press release, the end result is expected to be an innovative, sustainable solution for communities around the world to deal with non-recyclable plastics and plastic waste. And a pretty high percentage of, the, of uh, plastics are not recyclable, the kind that you find in these ocean environments. So um, cleaning up and then also the opportunity of using this waste to produce power. Um, that's an interesting approach. And again, ur urban, urban populations and cities could and should be leaders in, in promoting this. So what else? What else? What other ways are there that, that a city, that, that blue urbanism might, might be advanced? Well, there are sometimes fanciful ways of visually connecting us, you know, actually occupying uh, some some of marine and ocean environments. I'm not sure that I necessarily not not advocating this, but it's it's interesting to look around. Some of them are renderings and proposals, and like the, the hotel on the upper left is a reality. Actually, um, that's a you know um, that's a visceral connection. It may have some other impacts, of course, that we don't like. This is the example of the relatively new Oslo Opera House. Are there ways to connect urban and water environments and and uh, kindle or rekindle a uh, an interest in ocean environments. Um, this is an example from uh, um, uh, from New York, uh, the the Muma exhibition, Rising Currents, where par partly uh, there would be a glass wall that would uh, give visual connection to the to the water environments around New York. Even really uh, fanciful ideas uh, like this one. This is a, a Belgian architect who imagines floating cities uh, in in these. Kind of um, float around, and they would produce all their own power and and grow all their own food. And of course, it hasn't to happen. But um, is that a part of the solution? I'm not sure, not convinced. But there are many things, many other things we can do to to connect cities, viscerally connect them to ocean and marine environments. Um, two summers ago, we had a very interesting green, small uh, Greenpeace um, ex expedition that resulted in some pretty incredible uh, discoveries uh, at the uh, 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 the bottom of the ocean sort of discoveries of, of uh, unusual uh, creatures there um, could could cities be sponsoring expeditions and and 
and uh, ocean and coastal, ocean and marine resources? Could we be sponsoring protected areas that go well beyond the reach of uh, the boundaries of a city or, or, or beyond the site of a city? And, and uh, the Chagos Marine, one of the largest protected areas that the UK government has created not long ago in the Indian Ocean, another large uh, example of a, of a preserve, um, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Marine uh, National Monument. Um, I, I suggested or um, floated this very, I think, very interesting idea that maybe cities, cities have a lot of uh, sister cities around the world. Perhaps there's something that we might call an ocean sister city. And this is actually a quote from this Blue Urbanism uh, essay. Um, why shouldn't blue cities adopt a marine habitat, particular seamount, hydrothermal vent, or underwater rift valley populated with whales, sea turtles, or marine invertebrates? School children could learn about the habitat. Neighborhood clubs could organize cultural exchanges, and corporate donors could support research and intervention efforts. So kind of a crazy idea, maybe. An ocean sister city. So it may be a little hard to visit, a little hard to exchange delegations between uh, ocean habitat and that, that terrestrial city, but it's an interesting concept, this idea that we commit, maybe, uh, that cities not just commit to the ocean, the, the nearby ocean environments, but also um, commit to learning about and, and um, stewarding over and helping to protect and conserve ocean environments that may be some distance away. And, and how would that, how would that wor work? Kind of interesting. I'd be curious to hear about any um, reactions to that idea that some of you may, may have. Um, OK, so I am actually coming sort of to the end of this. I've got a few more slides. Other ways that cities could connect to ocean environments. This is the example of, of the Baltimore Aquarium uh, has a, uh, a satellite, a small satellite aquarium in the, on the second floor of the Barnes & Noble store in downtown Baltimore. It's an interesting idea. This is my fuzzy picture, but uh, if you could set up a camera and watch, people are just drawn to, to watching the fish and the um, watching the things moving around in this aquarium. It's a, it's a very uh, visceral demonstration, I think, of, of biophilia and biophilic um, urbanism. And do we need to do more of that, that kind of thing? Uh, are there ways to creatively connect urban uh, settings with things going on in oceans? In, uh, in Perth, they had a very interesting, there's a diving uh, organization that has a uh, camera that 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 sends 24 hours a day sends video from a shipwreck offshore and sends it to your your computer and, and anyone want, can log on and look it, it's sort of like the the uh, eagle cams and bird cams that we have you know uh, peregrine falcon cams that that let us uh, watch um, things that may be hard to see. Are there similar ideas that, that would help to viscerally connect cities and, and oceans? Here, the Humpback Whale Project, this is all about sound. The idea that, um, that we have these under, underwater uh, microphones that could be capturing the sound, sounds of many things underwater, but, but in this case, the songs of humpback whales, sending it back, sending it so that others can he hear it so somewhere in a, in a more urban environment, perhaps uh, perhaps hundreds of, of miles away. I actually passed over, I think, uh, another image. I'm going backwards. Oh, somehow I've missed an image. But there, um, there are uh, research projects that involve um, tagging um, a species, for example, tuna, and then, and then being able to, to uh, display their movement patterns uh, online and classrooms, uh, schools and classes can use that as, again as a way of kind of connecting to, to, to seeing something that would otherwise be difficult to see. Well there's also a civic dimension and so these are images actually of, of um, coast care, uh, chapters of something called coast care in, in Australia. It's a very impressive thing how many volunteers in that country uh, spend time, Saturdays and Sundays and other parts of their life helping to restore uh, coastal environments. It's mostly terrestrially oriented, as this image on the left suggests. But could we imagine, could we harness that, 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 that caring, that care for ocean and marine environments and steer it in the direction of uh, 
volunteerism and work that, that urbanites could do. Um, there are probably lots of ways that we could imagine that. This is one example, actually kind of a funny example of, of, of a, um, a woman in, in Delaware, Karen Allwood, who's become a bit famous for uh, on her on her uh, strolls and and, hi and her and her, her jogs along the beach, uh, turning over horseshoe crabs. And that the point of this really is to say that that we can make a huge difference even at an even e at an individual level. And and so if you read the article, it says that in um, in a period from mid May through the end of July, uh, Allwood turned over uh, almost 30,000 crabs that had the misfortune of, of being stranded, of, of being upside down. Um, that's a civic dimension. There are many other ways that, that, that we could make a difference. There are lots of uh, opportunities, in fact, for urbanites to be involved in, in marine and ocean science and, and lots of examples of citizen science. And this is one example of of the, uh, there are uh, hundreds of, of citizen spotters um, who who follow, look for uh, northern right whales as they as they move uh, from the north to the south. There's a cal calving uh, uh, grounds that the uh, along the South Carolina or along the Georgia and Florida uh, border, and those volunteers are very very important. The spotters are very important for tracking movements and understanding the biology of those of that particular species. I had the chance to to interview the head of this program called Dolphin Watch in in Perth, which is a very uh, interesting story as well. These are um, Indo Indonesian Indonesian um, dolphins, and they they actually occupy the river river environments in Perth, um, the Swan and Canning River, and there are 200 certified Dolphin Watch volunteers now who uh, who keep logs. And they they identify where they where they see the dolphins and there's a fin book that that uh, is a kind of comprehensive book for identifying individual dolphins so they're able to know which dolphin it is and uh, this is a this <coughs> volunteer citizen based uh, program is is connecting residents in, in in emotional ways to to the um, to this aquatic uh, environment. So a very, very positive um, story indeed. This is a drawing of my daughter from a couple of years ago. I love this, uh, the idea of combining peace symbols and whales. Um, but education uh, is a key part of this as well. So blue urbanism involves incorporating marine and ocean uh, education, marine and ocean environments, and everything that we do, everything we teach about, certainly, certainly all of our, our uh, environmental uh, curricula uh, ought to incorporate that. Um, here's an example from from Lisbon, in Portugal, where where there uh, the aquarium there called the Oceanario. Uh, it, it works with schools throughout the country, and they almost all the schools have a marine and ocean um, curriculum or a marine and ocean component to what they teach. I think that's ultimately what we're going to need to do as we move forward in building uh, uh, urban populations, developing urban constituents and, and, and um, people and families and organizations that will support uh, ocean conservation. So this one room that you see here is the main aquarium room. And what they do is they, uh, they bring um, classes. And the classes actually can sleep. They spend the night in, the, in this aquarium. Uh, room. So, so education has to be a key component as well. It can happen in 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 some unconventional ways sometimes. And this is a, an example from Hawaii, Anama Bay, a beautiful um, bay and 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 reef system that uh, harbors a lot of um, life. Uh, and but to to visit it, you start um, from kind of above, and you and you move down into the this beautiful cove, but to 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 be allowed to enter the park, uh, you have to make your way through this. You, you actually have to sit and watch a very a, a brief video about the about the, the beauty and 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 um, about how you should um, protect and and how you should behave in the in the park. Uh, perhaps uh, that's not a terrible thing to require sometimes that. Um, that as a condition of using something, of enjoying a particular habitat or visiting a particular habitat, that you might actually have to, 
to um, lear learn a little bit more about it first. And, and so there are a lot of very creative ways that, that we could uh, be teaching. So I actually am at the end of the slides. And sorry to have gone so fast over a lot of them. But um, so here is the question. I think it has been about an hour. And so I'd love to hear your reactions to any of this crazy, is this a crazy idea? Um, can we imagine urbanites caring about things they can't see and ocean and marine environments hundreds of miles away? I've covered a lot of ground suggesting that it's about rethinking fish, fish and fisheries. It's fishery management, fish consumption. It's about ports and movement of goods and shipping. It's about extending spatial planning so that it's not just we're not just planning and zoning, you know, in, uh, in fast ground or fast land or terrestrial land, but rather thinking about uh, how it extends into those water environments around uh, cities. Um, I've even suggested that that cities take some leadership in uh, protecting, learning about protecting and connecting with ocean environments maybe some hundreds of some distance away. The idea of, of ocean sister cities. That may be the strangest idea from from uh, from today. So I think that's it. There are um, some resources if anyone's interested. There, there is this extended essay um, called Blue Urbanism, City Planning and Oceans Found on Places. Places is a free online journal. And this was from 2011. And there's the, there's the website for it. And there are lots of other books and articles and, and readings that one could suggest. I'm going, coming full circle and saying that, for me, again, Sylvia Earle's uh, work has been very inspiring. And so I highly recommend her book, The Blue Planet, published by the National Geographic in 2009. OK, so I think that's, um, that is all for me. So I will stop. And hopefully, Brittany, you're there. Yeah. All right, Tim. Well, we have um, some questions that have come in. Um, OK. Uh, How do I see them? Are you just going to tell me what they are? I'm just going to read them out to yeah. you, and you can answer. You're going to read them to me. <laughs> okay. Yep. All right. Wow. All right. Well, our first question comes in from Salwa. Uh, what is the scale which can be used to illustrate the impact of cities on the oceans? Hmm. The scale. Um, well, I would say that it isn't one scale. I, I, I'd say it's a it's a multiple scale. This is this is frequently my, frequently my answer to planning um, that it's about embedded scales and and multi you know scaled in nature. Uh, there is the um, the the kind of bioregional scale that that is very important as we understand um, places you know like the Cape Cod example or if we look at that. Um, those ocean and marine environments that are are within reach, and you know that we can make a difference in affecting and have some control over, and it's probably going to require a some form of a regional agency. In the case of the Cape Cod example, it's the Cape Cod Commission, and there are many um, examples now of emerging ocean management entities. Australia has a whole marine uh, bioregional. Uh, planning a system with marine bioregional plans and, and that sort of thing. That's one really important uh, scale. But I guess what I'm suggesting is that we understand that, that our impact is global and that urban, particularly lar a large city, whether it's um, San Francisco or Boston or whatever, uh, is going to have an impact. That the, the material uh, needs of that, that population coming from, from thousands of miles affecting the larger world, that plastic ends up going uh, uh, far, far away. Um, the, the impact on climate change it is something that's global in, in nature. So I'd say keep keeping in mind all of those different scales. Um, and, but, but clearly that bi kind of bioregional, marine bioregion scale is a, is a pretty critical one, I would, I would argue. Great. Um, well, our next question comes in from Elizabeth. What types of corporate donors do you anticipate um, would be interested in supporting this research? Corporate donors. Wow. Um, gosh, it's a good a good question. One one might uh, imagine first the the corporations that have some 
reliance on on ocean commerce or or uh, you know fishing, and I, I I would hope maybe perhaps that 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 um, that some of some of the companies that that have been uh, involved and already are are very interested in in marine stewardship council and some of the promoting some of the sustainable fisheries would also would be more generally interested in in supporting uh, ocean conservation efforts or blue blue uh, or urbanism. Uh, I'd love to hear um, ideas from the from the audience, but uh, it, it it so the the food and and fishery kind of corporations involved in that. Uh, I could imagine uh, corporate corporations that. Uh, that have supported science programs and and you know the the the, the corporate corporate sponsorship of, of of aquaria and and um, biodiversity conservation work would would probably be the same. I mean they they ought to be just as interested in in, in blue urbanism as well. Maybe we can get some of the the, the foundations uh, who have been particularly interested in uh, helping. In, in advancing urban, an urban agenda, maybe we can also we can get them to steer them in the direction of more of an ocean uh, environment. But the answer is I'll have to think about that because I'm not sure that I have. It's a very good uh, question, and it, we need resources and we need sponsorship and we need uh, uh, the corporate world to be engaged. To be sure. Great. Um, our next question comes in from Vaughn. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about introducing inner-city urban youth into these Ooh. sorts of programs? Wow, um, that's a terrific uh, question. How? Yeah, I think that we we need to figure out. Just ha we haven't really even done this in um, you know we haven't done this at all. We've done it a little bit. We haven't really effectively connected inner city youth or um, you know to, to the to the terrestrial environments nevertheless the the ocean ocean and marine and environments but part of it is is through schools and and part of it you know through that educational that curricular side that I just mentioned that at the end but uh, I've, I've been very intrigued by local efforts and sometimes it is a nonprofit doing this, uh, or a, a non-governmental organization. But the efforts to get to to subsidize outdoor activities and learning, and to nudge kids along in this little book, Biophilic Cities, this, uh, that Brittany mentioned in the introduction. There's a, a little discussion of. Um, this nonprofit in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called Community Boating, where they they have a terrific program where they they basically for for one dollar uh, offer unlimited um, in, instruction in sailing, instruction in renting sailboats for for children for kids of a certain age um, between certain ages uh, for that particular season that 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 summer. One dollar. I mean, that that's a subsidy, of course, and but it it makes it easy and affordable for kids to learn how to sail. That's pretty good, and that helps helps bring kids put in contact with with um, uh, water water and, and and aquatic habitats, ocean habitats, not 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 ocean habitats per se, but uh, could we could could one do a similar thing for learning to snorkel or or scuba dive or um, uh, probably so or or go have um, whale whale watching uh, ex expeditions or think or outings or things like that that might connect inner city uh, kids to, to, to nearby uh, ocean environments. I think that's a terrific. Uh, idea, and again, maybe it maybe it it has to happen mainly through uh, schools. I mean, that that would be a logical uh, uh, kind of leverage uh, point of leverage. But uh, terrific, terrific question and terrific idea. I think. 
All right. Our next question comes in from Tracy. Are there any good general principles for coastal area land use planning? Um, perhaps try to maintain a buffer zone between urban land uses and the ocean or have good stormwater retention systems? Hmm. Yeah. Um, th th that, those would be a good place to start. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. I, I think um, we know that uh, anything we can do to to um, buffer those those most sensitive locations, uh, I suggested with the with uh, the example of the Cape Cod um, Ocean Plan that that there that there is a kind of McCargian approach that that one one can take and should take, where you're layering uh, just as we do in terrestrial environments, layering layering maps that that identify particularly sensitive locations, places that are particularly um, biodiverse. And then, you know, locating uh, potentially impacting activities away from or out of those places. Buffer zones are certainly uh, would certainly be a good a good part of it. Um, again, the allocation of, of of appropriate land use patterns, steering steering the most intensive development away from the most sensitive uh, marine locations, um, containing and controlling that stormwater was a good a good. A good suggestion. So that's a, actually a whole another you know subject that we could add to the the concept of blue uh, urbanism. That that blue urban cities. I started by saying that stormwater was not as not as key to what I was talking about, but um, there's no question that we could do a much better job containing uh, stormwater, um, a, a more decentralized uh, natural stormwater system of, um, based more on. Uh, uh, low impact development sort of techniques of green rooftops and and uh, rain gardens and bioswales and tree planting all those things that make up a, that, are, that are useful for greening cities um, could also fall into a general design you know category general design principle for for protecting uh, ocean ocean and marine um, environments as well but um, really what the what the question suggests is the need for a kind of marine and spatial planning uh, book, or textbook, or methods book, or something like that, and and, and I think that you could take the the, the example of of the ur urban land use planning kind of book that uh, many of us use in planning, a Chapin Chap uh, Chap Kaiser Godshock Burke kind of book, and think about what it means for um, ocean, ocean, and coastal, ocean and marine environments, and I think that would be very good. I, I have done a lot of work in coastal areas, but it's it, it tends to focus, it tends to apply design principles again in 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 a, in a very terrestrial setting. So it's often about setting back new development from the 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 edge, set, setting back, for example, you know. Uh, 60 times the average rate of erosion, uh, incorporating a, a sea level rise component into that. Uh, you know, there, there are a number of design principles that that we've been using in, in coastal planning for many for many years, and I, I think I'm just saying take those same ideas and expand them and extend them even even further. So, but that's a very good question. All right. Um, our next question comes in from Vaughn. Um, could you also expand um, on the number of closed-loop hydropho uh, hydroponic um, systems operating in mid-sized American coastal cities? Um, mm -hmm. These often um, help support economic development efforts, and uh, he's interested in hearing a little more about that. Yeah, um, and I, I can't say very much more ab about it except that that I've been I've been very um, interested, fascinated to follow the the Milwaukee example. I, I've I've had the good luck to visit Will Allen and his his uh, kind of prototype there in Growing Power in Milwaukee several years ago, and and was impressed by that. And there probably are a number of other examples of of that. I think mean, Will is there's nothing off. There wasn't at that time anything off the shelf. It was all it was all a system he designed. So you have, you know, pipes and it funny, it, it looks like something that was, um, you know, that was cobbled together and it kind of kind of was. And, but the basic idea of having a closed loop system that, that is synergistic and interactive so that the, you know, the waste from that fish, which is a problem 
end up circulating in a water you know, that that high nutrient water ends up ends up being food for those plants. Um, um, you know how, how to feed how to feed the fish becomes becomes an issue, and uh, in a closed loop system like that, and and Will's uh, Will's answer is to is to think about vermiculture. You know, he has he, he raises worms again and make and really makeshift systems. These aren't, aren't you know these aren't systems that you buy, but he makes them and basically taking um, food wastes from the from restaurants around Milwaukee and feeding that to his worm system, raising the worms, and then the worms can be food for the for the fish. So there are all kinds of, as the, as the question suggests, all kinds of economic ramifications and economic loops that um, a waste, something that was costing restaurants, you know, eventually becomes something that they, that, that's valuable and maybe they can even sell it um, and it becomes a revenue stream. Um, but it certainly uh, keeps all that stuff, keeps all that income, all that economic activity circulating in the in the community in a closed loop system. But but are there other examples? I, I know there have been uh, there are systems in New York, near New York City. Um, there there are a number of other closed loop uh, aquaponic um, systems that have been developed or being developed. Um, we're probably we probably have more examples of of more conventional aquaculture, uh, but that's possible as well, you know, and it, as long as it's it's um, um, not not doing, it's not damaging the ecosystem or the, the not resulting in huge pollution and, and um, uh, the, the introduction of non-native species and all the other, you know, kind of negative side effects from the large-scale aquaculture systems. So I, I don't really have a very good answer. I'd love to hear from the audience about local examples for them, if there are some really good ones out there. But I'm convinced that, that as the question suggests, this is a tremendous, has tremendous potential for generating econ an economic stream and producing something. It's, it has to be part of the, the local food uh, agenda. And, and so we have actually a very small uh, a group of graduate, a couple of graduate students here in our program have started a CSF here locally, which is not so much, it's not about marine or ocean environments, it's actually about uh, farm-raised uh, trout and catfish. And they are, they have connected local farmers in a kind of a network and um, paying them and then bringing, and then, and then, um, and then uh, seeking subscribers to this to the CSF, and, and so in a sense, connecting the the local the local pond-based systems with a, with an urban, a more urban uh, population. That could be that's certainly possible as well. All right, great. Um, well, our next question comes in from Janice. Um, she's curious to know um, as to whether you are aware of any coastal communities that are planning for the threat of sea level rise, um, <laughs> flooding, loss of land due to global warming. Yeah, well, uh, sure, Lot, lots of them, and um, they're big cities, medium cities, small cities. It's a huge, huge issue, and and I, I, as you can sort of tell, I stayed a little bit away from from talking about it here. Um, it, it's not clear uh, what the connections, what what the implications might be for for rising sea level for some of the policy things I've been talking about, but but it's a huge issue. Uh, we have uh, one of my, I have a studio class in the spring that uh, developed a uh, sea level rise adaptation plan for Virginia Beach. Um, so we're thinking about it here in, in Virginia. Um, I'm actually look, reviewing a book right now that involves case studies of San Francisco and, and New York. Uh, ev everybody is thinking about it. We hope they are. And the uh, adaptations, potential adaptations are, you know, Everything from from long-term shoreline re retreat, uh, rolling easements, and 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 using opportunities uh, to to shift the location of major public facilities out, out of uh, high risk, lo lower high risk locations. Uh, I think that's probably what we we ultimately need to do is to begin to to a, a longer-term process of, of shoreline retreat, strategic retreat, getting out of the way, structural improvements, and seawalls and levees and 
that kind of thing will will be possible in some places, but but are very uh, expensive and 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 damaging, uh, and and probably are ought to be a kind of second second uh, priority. But yes, the the it's a big big topic, a big subject, and we're uh, there are lots of places around the country and around the world uh, that are that are thinking about it and how to adapt to to, to long-term sea level rise. So it's a it's a very important uh, subject, and that I probably you know, it, it could be it's, it should be its own its own webinar. All right. Well, our next question comes in from Jim. Um, Oil exploration, uh, drilling, and transportation, um, they've all negatively affected vast parts of the ocean. Can um, these forms of energy even be compatible with blue urbanism? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan. Um, and uh, I, I think we need to transition. And, and of course, there is the, the backdrop of of the, the larger trends about oil, and and despite what's uh, what seems like a um, a, a, re a tappable resource in the Gulf, I think the longer term trends are, of course, that that we're going to see long term decline in global global oil supplies. Um, at the same time that we're seeing you know pretty dramatic increases in demand, so we've got to get ready um, to face a world where there's less oil. And that's good. Um, it's good for lots of reasons. It's good to, to um, you know, we, one future is of course shifting to uh, electric cars or something else, but that still requires a power source from source from somewhere. And if we're burning coal, that's not to, to, to produce that power. That's not very good either. But but I, I don't see a great future for oil. Um, I know that that's uh, there's a lot of debate uh, uh, about it, uh, but I, I think. You know, to be realistic, uh, it's it's they're back in the Gulf, and you know their uh, BP is um, you know producing more and more, and you know they're trying to produce more and more, and, and they'll be there. Other companies uh, it, just we have to be uh, apply a much more stringent and a much stronger regulatory uh, set of protections. It seems to me, and um, so it, it in the present uh, very low Max Cowboy um, framework that we have, I'm, I think it's not very compatible with blue urbanism. I'm afraid. So I guess my point is that uh, that cities, as uh, major points of consumption and demand, have the chance to to shift, have the chance to exert some ethical leadership about this, and say we're going to do what we can to wean ourselves off of oil, or if we, you know, the best we can, um, and short of that, to exert political influence to make sure that whatever is is extracted is done is done in the, in the most carefulest way possible um, of course it's easy to say that and the the politics are quite are quite difficult but but that uh, it's a good question and it's it's not a it's not a, it's a complicated uh, answer to be sure all right. Well, our next question comes in from Cirilla. Uh, I think it's going to be our last question for the day. Um, have you looked at the potential for oceans to provide carbon sequestration, uh, se sequestration sorry, to address uh -huh. cli climate change um, impacts? Yeah. Um, she understands that seagrass ecosystems provide a significant carbon yes. sequestration. Yes. Well, it's a really yes, and and the answer is yes. They, uh, it's a huge. In fact, it's been the biggest sort of uh, black box in some ways, the biggest missing piece of our understanding of the whole carbon uh, budget. And, and so you're absolutely right. There's a huge potential for sequestering carbon and. Huge, huge potential for the ocean to emit a lot of carbon because of the acidification and other things that we're doing. You know that. Um, so, but the, the implicit in the question, I think, was the idea that that maybe um, that maybe cities could begin to understand the the positive things we might do, the health of the ocean, um, as a as a carbon sink, in the same way that we instead of plant or in addition to planting trees and urban forests and doing all the other kind of more typical carbon sequestration things, that we also begin to understand the oceans as a key opportunity as well, a key opportunity in some ways to 
um, sequester more carbon, but also just to maintain the health, uh, to, to take steps to, to ensure that we don't lose the very, the very positive um, sink that, they, that oceans already are when it comes to carbon. So I think that's really an interesting idea. Um, and how we would, how we might um, implement that, is is an interesting thing. So that maybe there might be some kind of um, sequestration, some kind of a, of a regulatory measure that 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 just as we we require a certain um, mitigation for the loss of, of of an acre of forest or a wetland or whatever it is, we might actually have we, we might actually try to imagine a system where um, resources are funneled into restoring, as, you, as, the, as the question suggests, eelgrass or some kind of habitat uh, conservation or protection that would sequester carbon. I think that's a terrific, um, uh, a terrific idea. And, and so maybe somebody in the, in the audience today could um, help their community to, to establish such a pilot idea. I'd love it. Great. Well, um, I think that's about going to wrap, wrap it up for us today with our question and answer session. Tim, thank you so much for the presentation. I think sure, you know, enjoyed it. everybody really enjoyed it. Um, okay, great. For those of you who are still in the audience, I have a few um, last minute reminders on logging your CM credits for attending today's event. So if you want to just stay tuned in a, in a moment and I will bring that up. Thanks again, Tim. Okay. Thank you, Brittany. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, well, for those of you who are still with us, um, to log your CM credits for attending today's event, you can go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, December 10th. Um, and then you can select today's webcast, which is Blue Urbanism. Um, this webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. I'm trying to get my PowerPoint loaded up, I'm sorry. Um, also, we are recording today's webcast, so you will be able to find a recording of this webcast along with a six-slide-per-page PDF um, at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast-archive. And this does conclude today's uh, session, and thank you again for everybody attending.